Welcome to Psychology Today. I am one of your co-hosts, Sam Morrow. Thank you for watching. Our show is about bicycling in general and the celebration of our local cy cyclists. We hope that Psychology Today helps inspire you to ride a bike and helps you to be more mindful of safety. Those of us that volunteer for Psychology Today believe there's an abundance of bicycling activity to celebrate in the Portland metro area and we endeavor to introduce you to people who help our community of cyclists. I want to share a quick thank you to our capable crew behind the scenes, volunteers who make our show possible. If those on the screen are the talent, they are the brains. We haven't had a live Psychology Today show since March of 2020. The studio has been closed due to COVID-19. And we're excited to get back on the air and get in touch with all of you who have, had, have struggled with uh, COVID-19. Additionally, and probably not apparent, uh, this show is kind of a new beginning. Psychology Today uh, is no longer affiliated with Northwest Bicycle Safety Council because that organization has dissolved. So our crew behind the scenes is still our foundation and Wayne Hathaway and I will continue hosting. Our first post-COVID shutdown guest is returning bicycle spokesperson from River City Bicycle, Stefan Lemmer. And we'll learn his perspective on how the pandemic affected cycling and the bike shops in the second part of the show. We'll find out what's trending with bikes. So Stefan, um, you're gonna be our guest the entire show. So welcome to Psychology Today. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me back, yes. I'm anxious to hear what you have to say. So as always, I just want you to tell us a little bit about yourself, your your career and family and that sort of thing. Yeah, so my name is Stefan Lemmer. Um, I moved here from Germany 20 years ago and uh, work now for the last 19 years for River City Bicycles. Uh, I live out in the boring sandy area and um, have a wonderful family. Um, a wife and two kids and two dogs, two cats. So, <laughs> yeah, keeps me busy. So, no doubt. Yeah. And and your kids are teenagers, yes. so that's that really keeps you busy. Yeah. So, Stefan, you have been an avid bicycle tourist. I mean, kind mm -hmm. of pre-family anyway. Mm -hmm. So, I'd like you to tell us, uh, you know, some of the highlights of your touring because you really have some ex yeah. interesting experiences. Yeah. So, I in '94 I rode from. Um, the west coast to the east coast in Canada, and then back to Toronto. So that was a six-month trip. What um, was my first big experience um, outside of Europe? I did a lot of touring in Europe before. Uh, my whole family was into cycling. So with um, eight, when I was eight, we actually did a 500-mile bike tour with the family, four boys, and you know my parents. And so it was really awesome to grow up like that. And then in 97, I rode from Alaska to Mexico. Um, that was more than a year. And yeah, touring changed a lot in the last 20 years. Ah. Just how people like to go touring, what is more important. Uh, now it's more important how to charge your cell phone and be on Facebook. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I did it, I didn't have a cell phone, <laughs> so it changed quite a bit. But it's a very, very good yeah, experience. Yeah. So one of the things I've heard some of your tales before, mm -hmm. and I don't remember them all explicitly, but please share the story of how you came to meet your wife. So yeah, the funny part was that during my bike tour, um, I ended up after the Yellowstone, I ended up in Idaho in the hospital uh, and my appendix broke. So after the surgery, after a few days of recovery, the only way out of Arco, where the little town, was a Greyhound bus to Portland, Oregon. And I never had plans to go to Portland. <laughs> so I arrived after 20 hours in the bus, and the only way I could stay there was in the youth hostel, what is the Pearl District now, so the youth hostel is even not there anymore. And it was rainy, it was end September, people were unfriendly, and my bike was damaged in the transport, and it was not a very good experience. So two days later, I left Portland and said, oh my gosh, I will never <laughs> come back. That is the worst town <laughs> ever. And uh, so I came back to Germany 
and I worked in the bank before and after. And a month later, I met my wife who had relatives over there. And the first question, of course, where are you from? <laughs> and she's so Portland, Oregon. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> but yes, it worked out. And I am now here very happy. Yes. <laughs> I just love that yeah, that so. story, and y and you're such a great storyteller. Yeah. So we Thank can spend you. the whole show <laughs> listening to your tales. Yeah. So, uh, what are your personal goals right now? You know, do you have any, you know, life goals that when the kids are gone and that sort of thing? And you know, just trying to be still healthy and you know, spending a lot of time with my wife uh -huh. and supporting my kids and um, just enjoying the outdoors. Uh, we like to go hiking and. Uh, just to be as much outside as possible. So y you have kind of transitioned, not that you're not a bicyclist mm. anymore, but more into hiking at this point. Yes, I'm um, volunteering with Search and Rescue for the last four years, and uh, that takes a lot of time. Yeah. And so I'm, um, yeah, my only big riding right now is really commuting, or what is a long commute when I ride all the way in and out, it's over 50 miles yes. both ways. So. And uh, but mostly I'm really just riding, commuting, or on the weekends once in a while. So not as much anymore. Yeah, yeah. So you typically commuted mostly on the Springwater Quarter, yes. right? Yes, it is five miles from my house to the Springwater Trail, and then twenty-two miles from Boring Station uh, to River City. Yeah. So that's been yeah. pretty clean and clear. Yes. Good. Yeah. So so let's get back to the the present. What effects has COVID-19 have had on you and your family? I think most likely just not to get out as much. Mm -hmm. I mean, the most trails were closed during the pandemic last year. Um, and for me personally, I really missing the group rides. I'm a big fan of Reach the Beach uh -huh. and all these organized rides. And um, it was kind of hard to see that all these rides got canceled. You know, yeah. I understand why, but yes. it was still hard. And also then to see like my kids who really couldn't, couldn't meet with friends or do other events. Mm -hmm. You know, going just out with friends, meeting friends. Um, for a year, we didn't even meet my mother-in-law who just lives, you know, two houses down the road just because of the COVID. Yeah. Uh, to have Mother's Day, my, my mother-in-law sits inside and we are sitting outside on the table, you know, we just talk through the window it's a different experience. Yes, yeah. Yes. Well, it's kind of getting back to it. Yeah, we are very thankful now, yeah. So we are all vaccinated, and um, so it goes in the right direction. Yeah, good. So uh, you, you kind of touched on how it affected your, s your cycling, mm -hmm. that there weren't group rides mm -hmm. and things. Do you see yourself then doing some Reach the Beaches yes. and that sort of thing yes. again? Yeah, definitely. Hopefully yeah. get back to it. Yes. Have you done yeah. Seattle to Portland? Yes, I did it twice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's it's a really good ride. Yes. Yeah. Ho maybe they'll be back yeah. next year. They, I don't know. They were really caught, I think. Mm -hmm. They had it on the schedule and they pulled it back off. That, that You know, yeah. you get to the point where you're having to spend money and you kind of. You have a lot of responsibility for someone. Like yes. For all the people. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and at that point, they probably didn't see how they could make it work. Yes. And maybe it would have. I don't know. Yeah. So you're an employee at River City, and and what's your perspective of the effect on of COVID nineteen just generally on the local cycling community? I think the biggest the biggest uh, effect for all the bike store was mm -hmm. that the inventory of companies went down really fast. I think the companies, they were not um, expecting that people want to get outside on the bike and just the inventory to order bikes was uh, completely uh, messed up. Uh -huh. So when, uh, you know, we cannot get bikes, a lot of companies are completely sold out for the rest of the year, okay? And that's already for two, three months. You know, when people come in, we have people waiting since last year, November, for their bikes, and they hopefully get them now in June, July. <laughs> and it's painful. It's really yeah. painful. And there's a shortage on technically everything outdoor, not just in the cycling world. You know, kayaks, yeah. bike racks, wha whatever you're looking for, everything outdoor is very low in inventory. But people don't understand that. You know, when you say, hey, we can order you the bike, but 
I don't know if it comes in September, Christmas, maybe next year. We don't know. It sounds funny, but yeah. unfortunately, that's the reality. Wow. Yes. That would be hard, trying to help people get into cycling. And I know, having dealt with you before, mm -hmm. how enthusiastic you are. And to not be able to do your usual routine, sharing this passion with people, yeah. to say, eh, I don't know. Yeah. And we had people like... They sold their bikes because they want to upgrade, but then <laughs> oh the new no bikes way. were not available. Uh -huh. So then they really stuck. And um, our, uh, with River City, the issue was that we have so many people working there that we had to close the store down. Since last year, March, our store, the inside is closed for customers. Yeah. And so that makes it a little bit more complicated. And I would say most of the people are very understanding. And... Um, and you know, uh, selling-wise, we had a very good year because people just really looking for bikes left uh -huh. and right. So it was a very successful, especially in the spring. But again, people don't understand that bikes, we get bikes in, they are <laughs> sold in two, three days. And, you know, people say, I want to think about it. And they call two days later and the bike is sold. So wow. And then it's not available for another few months. And it is sometimes very, dis uh, very disappointing and, you know, frustrating. So I the way River City did it is you're just kind of operating out of the parking lot. And yes. I've, I've gone through that, and it's very uh, organized. And it, I bought a new helmet yeah. there, and it was very helpful. And every, people took their time with me. Yeah. But I guess my thought was that there's no impulse buying because you're not going into the store yeah. and, oh, I'll get a new water bottle. Yes. Oh, I'll, I like this jersey. Yeah. It is interesting because, like, every salesperson has their favorites. You know, when somebody said, hey, I'm looking for a helmet, uh -huh. you automatically ah. ring. You know, when the customer is sure. not already coming in or coming to the store and says, I'm looking for this and this helmet. Uh -huh. When he just says, I'm looking for a helmet, you automatically grab, you know, three, four helmets you like. And mm -hmm. so, like you said, yeah. we don't really sell too many little items. Yeah. What a customer inside would maybe look forward mm -hmm. to clothing sales went quite a bit down just because we don't have fitting room so people really yeah. cannot try stuff on um but again hopefully in the next you know one or two months it will change y yeah you'll feel so so your big issue is that you just have so many employees running around yes. and then to throw customers in there too it's just too yeah. congested because people have, have to do it through the web store or you know through the internet we have a lot of more phone service or you know computer set up in the whole store uh, so what just means with the six feet distance right now uh -huh. um, and we have 75 people and more working at river city we really like my computer is in the middle of the shoe department <laughs> and so a customer couldn't look at the shoes because that's all with computers and uh -huh. so um, we're working on that everybody gets vaccinated we are uh -huh. almost there and then we're thinking about I know, see. in the near future to change this again. Yeah. Having inside and outside uh -huh. uh, customer service. Okay. So we will see. Yeah, everybody's just yes. trying to juggle it. So um, I wanted to take this, this time, I'm really involved in Portland Bicycling Club, mm -hmm. and we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. So we started in 1971, and we did change our name. It was Portland Wheelman Touring Club, and now it's Portland Bicycling Club trying to be more inclusive and we haven't had bike rides and we are, we do have bike rides now but mm. for probably over a year we didn't have bike rides until the science kind of showed that it what tr covid wasn't transmitted on mm. bike rides outdoors yeah. and so it we came to believe that mm. outdoor activities were were safe even in in at least somewhat of a group yeah. so we do have rides populating our calendar again which you know might cause more angst with <laughs> your customers because yeah. now there's rides and don't have a bike. So I read an article recently in uh, the in my local paper that bike store owners in state, and this would be Washington mm -hmm. State, vexed by shortage. And I mainly I just wanted to use the word mm -hmm. vexed. I like that word. But uh, you talked about the supply chain. How is that? How do you see that uh, playing out? You said that they didn't have any did, did uh, manufacturers just shut down initially? Just that was totally one of the main reasons that they had to uh, shut down factories overseas in Asia. Oh. 
uh, that was the biggest thing. Uh -huh. And then, um, like it is in every industry with cars, bikes, it's just not one factory. You know, like a bike uh -huh. is the frame, then another company makes the components. And so when there is one factory who cannot deliver the components, then everybody else is waiting. And so Shimano, who was one of the, is one of the biggest company in the bike business, had more orders mid last year than the whole year before. Then so they really couldn't deliver their components to the bike factories. And so they couldn't assemble their bikes. And so that all came together. And so, yeah. and then for example, Santa Cruz, a company down in California and got very, uh, a big hit with the fire last year in September. Oh. Uh, their building got damaged. Some people lost all their own houses. And so they were completely stressed out with, you know, like this situation, not getting bikes from overseas. And with Santa Cruz, for example, since I would maybe say April, it's almost no new bikes are coming in for the rest of the year. Yeah, yeah. And so it makes it really hard. Yeah. You know, that um, people dream about their bikes and then like people have plans now for the summer uh -huh. going on a trip and, you know, you say, sorry, you know, and we have customers coming in asking for a bike, let's say for $700 and there's nothing out there. The only one we have is $1,200 still left and, you know, it's not really easy to spend almost twice the price or more than twice the price yeah. for a bike. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, some people have to do that. But um, all together, I think it gets better. Sure, now. I mean, sure. You know. Well, and it's hard to be mad about it because it's just like circumstantial. Yeah. And what are you going to do? Exactly. Yes. So, yeah, like you say, hopefully it'll come together. So, how do you buy a bike these days? How do you? Um, really, just call every store what is out there. Uh huh. You know, like um, River City, fortunately, is on the bigger side here in Portland. So we have a big order. We have the possibilities to put more orders in. Um, I feel very sorry for smaller stores who don't really have the possibilities to, you know, put a bigger order in. Yeah. And uh, so it is very, very hard to get bikes for these guys. And it's not just bikes. It's, um, you know, with everything, with yeah. chains, uh, tires, tubes. We were out of some really, you know, common tube sizes just yeah. because they were not available uh -huh. and uh, we have brands now in I never heard before <laughs> it's just because <laughs> the normal brand we have on tubes <laughs> tires they are out so uh -huh. we're looking to get anything in just to have for customers oh gosh what they need so. well I I think we all appreciate that yeah. that is just really wild because I don't know it seems like if you were gonna buy a bike you'd bring out a bunch of different bikes and yeah. we'd test ride them to see what worked best and now it's this is what we have Yes. Take it or leave it. Yeah. Wow. And the reason for that is that we have so many bikes coming in now who what we sold last year. So we have every day 30 to 50 bikes to assemble. So we don't even have the possibility, uh, unfortunately, right now to even just o assemble a bike for a test ride. Uh, just, you know, like before, and you remember in the past, you came in and we had 50 bikes mm -hmm. on the shelf. We have five bikes right now in the store to even just show customers. Um, we have a ton of bikes, but they're all in boxes. And unfortunately, it takes almost two weeks to get them assembled. And so same thing. People come in expecting to buy a bike right away. And then you tell them it takes two weeks to even actually test ride a bike. Uh -huh. uh, some people don't really like that. But unfortunately, that's yeah. the case. Yeah. Across the board. It's yes. not, not you. Yeah. And what's the status then on bike repairs? We s there is a problem with parts too. Same things, yeah. Uh -huh. um, quite often we don't have the parts to repair bikes or we are so, so overwhelmed that right now for bigger repairs, it's almost, I think, end of July, something like that. So, you know, like we do flat repair and little maintenance, but for bigger like tune-ups or things like that, yes, it can take a few weeks. And um, and that's been consistent for quite a while yes. now, hasn't it? Yes. I know people have said. Just because a lot of people getting out their old bikes. Yeah. You know, we have yes. a lot of people coming in and said, I have this bike for 30 <laughs> years in the barn. <laughs> I don't find a new one. So what can we do to make this bike work, you know, work again? So, yeah, it's interesting. So maybe that works, but maybe if it needs parts, they're in the same jam. Yeah. 
Geese farts are easy to get because they oh. are old farts. You know, oh. Just the new stuff is, uh -huh. in most cases, not available. Uh, okay, yeah. okay. So if you get out your crystal ball, how do you see all this resolving? Or is it starting to resolve? I would say maybe not this year. I think that it will be a tough year for the bike industry just because of the inventory the companies have. Um, but I really think that people have to wait for next year. But then I, I hope, I really hope that, you know, beginning of next year they catch up and it comes back that uh, they're getting the items back in. And um, it is... Right now, when you look on availability on bikes, it is frustrating. You know, sometimes you look at a company's inventory and they say beginning of 2020. <laughs> and we hope that is the case. You know, like companies don't even know when they are getting the bikes in from overseas. Yeah. And they say it is here in March. Then in March, you get a call. Oh, no, it is in July. And then right now, oh, it's end of September. So they really don't know even their inventory when it comes back because they are just so overwhelmed in okay. products. And um, yeah, there's there as a retailer, there's nothing we can do about it. No. But we are the persons who talk to the customers. Yes. So it is, and we have calls from all over the US, from Canada about bikes. I had three customers today from Philadelphia, Chicago, and somebody in Florida calling if, if we have this one bike in stock. They looked all over the US and somehow, you know, came to our website, but it's really interesting how there's really a big shortage of bikes, big time. So, and globally, yeah. you're saying, I mean, yes. you mentioned U.S. states, but yes. globally. My brother, he works in a bike store in Germany, Munich, uh -huh. and they have the same problems, yes. Wow. Yeah. That's, well, I'm glad I have a bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, hold on to it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or make money and sell it. That's <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> yeah, really, it's my, my big chance. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's take a quick break and uh, a safety video about, about uh, well, bicycle safety. And then we'll come back with more psychology today and our discussion with Stefan Lemmer. And we're going to switch gears a little for the other part of the show and talk to him about what's trending, what's happening with, uh, if you can get a hold of things, what's happening with, with e-bikes and uh, bikes in general, brakes and drivetrains and helmets and just, you know, what's new. So we'll come back after the safety video and talk some more. Thank you. Maybe you ride to school. Maybe you ride for fun. Either way, when you're on a bike, you want to get where you're going safely. To do that, you need to remember a few key things. Be visible, follow the rules of the road, and be predictable. Okay, that's it, we're done. Well, not done exactly. We might have a few more things to say. When we say be visible, what we mean is be easy to see. Drivers should be watching for you, and they are, but do your part. Make sure your bike is ready for riding, and that includes having working lights and reflectors. In the daytime, wear bright colors. At night, wear something reflective, either clothing or gear. And dress for safety. If you're wearing loose pants, for example, strap down the pant leg on the chain side of the bike like this, so it won't get caught while you're riding. And wear a bike helmet when you ride. It may or may not be the law where you live, but it's always a good idea. Of course, part of the idea of wearing a helmet is not to put it to the test, not to have a wreck in the first place. And that's all about where you choose to ride and how you do it. Bikes are considered vehicles. So when you're riding a bike on the road, follow the same rules as car drivers do. Just like a driver, you need to look for and obey road signs and traffic signals. We're talking stop signs, yield signs, red lights, and so on. Keep to the right, but far enough from parked cars so you don't get clipped by a door that opens suddenly. Usually that's at least three feet. 
But what happens when you don't have three feet? When the lane narrows, for example, that's when you need to take the lane. Taking the lane means that you move into the center of the lane, just like a car. You should do this when the lane narrows or when you're coming up to an intersection or some other kind of turn. In these situations, the center of the lane is usually the best place to be. When it's time to change lanes, you should look for traffic, signal, and then move one lane at a time. Traffic will always be changing, so it's important to look and signal each time you want to change lanes. Anytime you're uncomfortable with a traffic situation, you have choices. You can get off the bike and walk on the sidewalk. You can choose a different route, one that has bike lanes or slower traffic. Or you can use a combination of bike and transit. But no matter where you're riding, a road or a trail, always watch out for people walking. Move out of their way and let them know when you're about to pass them on the left. On your left. If there's one thing drivers count on, it's predictability. So one of the best ways to be safe is to be predictable. For example, use hand signals before you turn or stop. Ride in the same direction the cars are going, with the flow of traffic, not against it. And don't assume that drivers will see you just because you see them. You already know this part, but we're gonna say it anyway. Put your phone away while you're riding. You don't want to be talking or texting because you need to be alert and paying attention to what you're doing. Same goes for earbuds or headphones. You need to hear what's going on around you, so leave them in your bag for later. Keep both hands on the handlebars unless you're signaling, and keep your eyes open for hazards. Things like wet roads, gravel, debris, anything that can mess with your ride. As we said up front, it really comes down to three things. Be visible, be predictable, and follow the same rules as a car. Make sure that drivers can see you, that you let them know what you're about to do, and that you're following the rules of the road. That's it. Have a good ride. Welcome back to Psychology Today, and I always like those safety videos. It's one thing to read, like the, the manuals and the laws and that sort of thing, but it's really beneficial to watch what you're supposed to do and how you can do it. And also, I want to point out how well those helmets fit on, on their he heads. They were tight, you know, about two fingers here for their forehead. The straps were right and under the ears, and so if they fell, that helmet was going to stay right where it was. So that's, that's always good to see. So usually at this point in the show, I like to encourage people to get out and ride their bikes. And as I said, I know I'm involved with the Portland Bicycling Club. We've got rides on our calendar. But some of the other local organizations, clubs, and uh, other organizations that put on bike rides are putting rides on the calendars. And uh, I just wanted to share some of those. Reach the Beach has already happened. I've got the Reach the Beach jersey hanging here. Reach the Beach was May 15th. And so um, that's happened. They're already now registering for 2022. And Strawberry Century down in Lebanon, Oregon is coming up on June 12. And the Columbia Century Challenge is also on June 12. I'm not really familiar with that ride. I think it's in the Scappoose St. Helens area. Maybe more challenging. Yeah, so so that's a relatively new ride. Uh, you can just Google these these ride names, I'm sure, and, and find information. And you might also go to Portland Bicycling Club because we're put we're doing them as club rides. It's a long story, but they're on our calendars too. So you might be able to get information that way if you're interested. Because I know some people are just ah, give me a ride. So Ride Around Clark County, or RAC, R-A-C-C, -C, is put on by Vancouver Bicycling Club. It's always been a, a May ride. They've moved it into summer now. It's July 24th. 
And so that starts in Vancouver and you go up into North Clark County and, and you can do various distances and that's always a good ride. The gorge ride, so the gorge being the Columbia River Gorge, is a ride that starts in the Dalles and you climb up to Rowena Crest and then um, use the old scenic highway to go through the Mosier tw Twin Tunnels and to the Mark Hatfield, I think it is, uh, State Park there just out of Hood River. And that's a, a favorite for many and also importantly it raises money for the Friends of the Historic Columbia River Highway. And they've had fires and mudslides and all kinds of things so they've always got big projects going on and it's just a wonderful place out there. Um, Monster Cookie, which is put on by the Salem Bicycle Club, has always been an April ride and this year it's August 29th. So that's a ride that goes from the Oregon State Capitol area right in front of the Capitol building and goes to Shampooey Park and at least in the past, I don't know if it for sure this year, you could pre-order your lunch and you'd have a box lunch waiting for you there at the park and you're about 30 miles into the ride and then you ride back to Salem. So it's a metric century. It's really relatively flat. It's a really good ride to do if you're trying to build up, you know, kind of inching towards a century to do a metric century. The Monster Cookie is always a good choice. And finally, I've got Harvest Century, which kind of kept their same position because they're September 11th. And that's a popular ride too. I, I haven't done that one. Maybe yeah. this is a year. Very good one. Okay. Yes. And what one. area is that? It starts in Hillsboro and then okay. goes out to Forest Grove, uh, this area, the North Plain, uh -huh. and um, very nice scenery. The streets sometimes can be because it's, I I remember it was a Sunday morning. I think. Uh huh. Um, it was sometimes on the busier side, so you have to be careful. I did it with my young daughter, and there were moments where I said, "Whoa." That's, you know, the cars don't really take enough distance to you, but uh, the rest stops are really awesome uh -huh. and uh, very nice support. And it was a beautiful day. What sometimes <laughs> in September, yes, you know, it can not. be a different. So. But I think they've moved it up a mm -hmm. few weeks, yeah. trying to get the summer more In the summer past, I fall. think it was the end of the riding yes. season, so it was their final ride. But, yeah, it's, it's a nice ride. It's okay, really thank you. So uh, also I wanted to mention, uh, again, being Portland Bicycling Club member, we're now offering what we're calling rookie rides. So th those are now on our club calendar. A lot of different club members have volunteered to do some. And these are rides that are group rides, meaning we all stay together. We're not going to drop you or leave you behind. And we'll go 10 or fewer miles and paced really for the slowest riders the way those turn out. So we hope that you can ride maybe 8 to 12 miles an hour, but uh, just short, slow, trying to help you get on the bike, learn some skills, and um, if whether you've got a new bike, you were lucky enough to get a new bike right now, or you dusted off an old one and you're trying to get out and ride it, this might be a place to start. And, you know, just riding with groups, you really learn bike skills and uh, just some of the things that we watched on that video, how to get make a left turn in traffic, how to take the lane, um, how to use that bike lane, things like that. So uh, we'd encourage you to take a look at our calendar, and I hope you'll, you'll come out. This is something new we're, we're doing, trying to bridge a gap for those newer riders that can't ride 20 miles or 30 miles yet and try to get you so that you can reach some cycling goals that you might have. Very important on this part is that the bike still has to work. Yes. Um, I remember we offered uh, rookie rides and ah. sometimes people, because they are not used to cycling, they came with a bike what was not just low air pressure, it was just really flat. Oh. The gears didn't work, the brakes didn't work. And it was more like, oh, we have to fix up this bike <laughs> first before we can on a go on a safe ride. So uh, at least your bike should be rideable. Yes. And so very important to yeah. enjoy the ride. Good, good point. Yeah. Okay. okay. And a lot of times we're having uh, some of our experienced cyclists are helping out and they might have a tool or two yes. and be able to adjust the seat. Nothing dramatic yeah, no, like no you're big, describing. No big service. Yeah. Yes. But we could pump up a tire. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But thank you. All right, well, let's get back to Stefan, who's chiming in here and helping me out with some of this stuff, and I really appreciate it. So he's sharing uh, some of his experiences uh, with the pandemic and the way it affected the bicycle market and things. 
but now we're going to kind of look to the future and be confident that we're going to be out there and talk about what's trending, what's happening um, with, with bicycle riding and coming down the pike. We read about new things. And I want to start with the kind of, to me, the biggest topic is e-bikes or electric assist bikes. Tell us about those and what's happening there. Very big market, yes. Um, it is very, very big already in Europe for many, many years, I would say, for five, six years at least, very big. Um, and in the last three, four years, you know, rise quite a bit here in the U.S. Um, it is really a nice ride. I, I got one many years ago just for fun riding. Uh, there are so many different models out there, road bikes, mountain bikes, like hybrid bikes mm -hmm. with electric assistance and... Um, the new thing really is they get lighter, mm -hmm. they get, you can ride longer distance, um, and unfortunately price-wise also they start a little bit higher in uh -huh. price, um, I would say maybe fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars up to more than a car. Yeah. Yeah, we have <laughs> bikes for, you know, twelve thousand, sixteen thousand dollars on an e-bike, uh -huh. um, but again, it's the best way, we, and to be honest, I was like that in the beginning, I said, hey. When I retired, then maybe an e-bike. <laughs> <laughs> but the best way to really get this experience is to test ride one, and um, when we have it. Yeah. Uh, but it's really really nice because you still get your workout when you want to. Mm -hmm. But uh, for longer distance, you know, like when you have a lot of climbing, um, it is a really nice support. Uh, the thing is that they are heavy. Mm -hmm. Okay, like my bike is, I think, fifty five, fifty six pounds. So to lift it on a car rack or lift it somewhere when you live, you know, on second floor, uh, you have to be aware of that, that they are yeah. very heavy. Uh, you have to charge the battery. But again, mm -hmm. newer models, they, get b they become lighter. You can ride longer distance and just test riding it. And, and like, like any bike, you need to have considered, what do I want this bike for? What, exactly. what am I going to do with it? Exactly. Or you buy the wrong bike. Yeah. It's... Also, uh, you know, how you want to use the bike, mm -hmm. okay? And I know a lot of people who didn't ride at all, okay, because of back problems, because of knee problems, because of not fit enough. Um, and so the e-bike really helps you still to get your fitness, your exercise, but it gets you out and gets you from point A to point B mm -hmm. easier, faster and easier yeah like i know on my e-bike i can make it in one hour and 10 minutes when i have to um on a normal bike that's the question if i can do it in this time <laughs> but the e-bike really really helps to um especially when you know you know you don't want to arrive and you're completely sweaty yeah. and things like that uh -huh. um you don't really worry about headwind because you have an e-bike it still goes ah. and so it is a really nice way but again, it's the maintenance is a little bit more with the battery. Uh, you have to, you know, the software you have to um, update mm. on a regular basis. Uh -huh. And you have a battery. So someday the battery will die, like on every electric, yeah. electric uh, item. And then you have to buy new batteries. And they are still on the spendy side. Sure. So sure. 800 to, you know, $1,000 uh -huh. for a new battery. Uh -huh. And uh, so... Yes, and then like newer, higher-end bikes, they are very high-tech. So you actually mm. can download an app on your cell phone, and then you can tell the, the bike how much battery life you want to have in the end, uh, how much battery oh, you like when wow. you climb. And uh -huh. so there is a lot of knowledge and, you know, electric <sighs> involved. So um, it's like the cars these days. Yes. You know, it's not just sitting on it, pushing the button, and <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Uh, so it really depends how much you want to, you know, spend on the bike, how much you want to use it. Uh-huh. And how interesting interested you are in the technology. Exactly. Yeah. And then, like, electric mountain bikes quite often are not allowed in uh, for on forest roads here in mm. Oregon. So that's another thing. Uh, check with your, you know, forest service uh, or the ranger station where you live, if you can actually use your mountain bike on these trails. Yeah. For example. So, and these are assists that, mm -hmm. like you say, you have to pedal, so there is some level of exactly. fitness and it can be up to you. 
Um, but aren't there some bikes that are more of a throttle and I don't know what I'm talking you about. You can, yes. Uh, in the beginning, it was not allowed from state to, it's different from state to state. Uh -huh. uh, there are also three categories on e-bikes, how fast they go. And the most e-bikes shut, you know, the engine shuts off, shuts off when you ride uh, 20 miles and faster. Mm. Uh, and then there are some with 28 miles. Um, and so it, it really it depends, again, how much you want to spend, how much power you need on your motor. Uh, there are two different styles, like where the motor is in the rear wheel or right under the crankset, yeah. in the crankset. Uh -huh. And good things about every, sure. every style. Pros so really and cons, exactly. yeah. Okay, well, that's a good overview. Certainly, if you're thinking to buy one, you should probably do a little research and yes. get to the store to find out more. Yes. Um, all right, let's move to brakes. What's happening with brakes? Is it all disc brakes now? All disc brakes these days, yeah. I think we have two bikes in the store with all disc brakes. It's oh. Disc brakes really is the way to go. Uh huh. Especially here in the Northwest with the wet streets and, you know, with rain. Um, disc brakes is really the way to go. Okay. Yes. I mean, we have a lot of kids' bikes, little 24, 20-inch kids' bikes with disc brakes. So it really goes this way. Yeah. Yes. So you're serious. It's the regular pads and stuff are more or less going away? Yes. They do it on some very, very high-end road bikes to save weight. But even now, oh. they came so down with the weight on disc brakes that even this goes slowly away. But, um, like, my road bike is, you know, 10 years old, so it's still using rim brakes. Uh -huh. But uh, every other bike I own is coming with disc brakes, yeah. Yeah, that's the way. And you, you can't just put disc brakes on any old bike. No, unfortunately, your frame has to be prepared mm -hmm. to put the brakes on. And your wheels, you know, the hub has to be prepared to put the rotor on. Uh -huh. So when it's not prepared for it, then unfortunately not. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you had said, especially here in the Northwest, so th it's just a safer, more secure stop in the wet, muddy, yes. wintry fall. Because on the rim brake, your rim is getting wet. When yes. you get in the white, and this is where you put it on, and mm -hmm. over time, you have to replace your rims uh -huh. over time. And uh, so with disc brakes, because it's, you know, in the center of your wheel, um, way, way nicer. Yeah. And you, when you remember the rotor on the disc brakes, is with a lot of cold, so it's yeah. not getting as hot like your rim. Uh -huh. It's not as much stress, and so it's definitely you get you have more control over your bike when you use disc brakes. And it depends if you have mechanical disc brakes with a cable or hydraulic disc brakes. Oh, okay. And so the hydraulic disc brakes really is, let's say every bike's mountain bike or hybrid bike, you know, I think six seven hundred dollars and up should come with hydraulic disc brakes. I mean, road bikes. Starts for around fifteen hundred dollars. Interesting, boy. That's that's kind of a big big change. Yeah. Um, how about electronic shifting? Is that still coming along? Very very big. Yes, and um, Shrem just came out with. So they always coming a step down. So with like rival now, what is right in the middle. Uh huh. Uh, they now for two thousand twenty two came out with electric shifting and Shrem. It's a company, their electric shifting, they call it ETAB access, is actually Bluetooth. You have no cables. It's really, you have a battery on your front derailleur, a battery on your rear derailleur, and a battery in your shifters. And they all, you know, talk to each other, and it's it's really awesome. Yeah. Yes. yeah. It's expensive, but very <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And so speaking of talking to each other, computers, bike computers. Yeah, bike computers these days, um, we still have basic ones, you know, uh -huh. $50, $60, just like in the old days. Um, the big, big trend for the last four or five years is really GPS systems, uh, where you can talk with your cell phone, um, you can download rides, and then actually, like Garmin or... Wahoo, and I can show something like this one. So this is this company here. Um, and so this one, for example, talks to your phone. You can download rides and share them with somebody else you're riding with. And so it's really awesome. Oh. You did a really awesome ride. You can save it and send it to somebody else's computer, and then they can do it. Um, and they show you weather, you know, how the, what the weather forecast is. Um, 
when somebody calls you on your phone, it shows on the computer. So like at the safety video, you know, uh -huh. keep your cell phone away. Yeah. Uh, and you see it actually on your computer if somebody calls you. Uh huh. So if it's important, you can pull over and exactly t deal with it. Exactly. Well, yeah. yeah re really, really, and of course, price is going up. Sure. You know, quite a bit, but what you get for it, the whole ed electronic is really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And some yeah. people just thrive on all that yes. stuff. So. Um, cycling shoes, anything happening in the shoe world? Just like in the last 50 years, it always becomes uh, lighter and uh, stiffer. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah not, <laughs> not too much in the clothing or shoe world. Um, yeah, I mean... They just kind of got that they, dialed down. Yeah, they get it dialed in uh -huh. and maybe, again, the weight. Like yeah. everything in the bike business, everything has to become lighter and lighter. And uh, it's really amazing what shoes these days, how, how light they are. Uh -huh. You don't even feel in that you're wearing it. It's really impressive. Um, the whole system, how you close a shoe changed in the last few years. Yeah. And, uh, they call it the BOA system. Very, very nice. Yes. Oh, I'm still using yeah. shoelaces. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> how about bike seats? Same thing. I uh -huh. mean, bike seats, um, there are a lot of companies out there, and uh, I think for me the most important part is really to know what seat fits your riding style. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of customers are looking for more soft parts on their saddle, and fact is, softer not is, is not always better. Okay, it depends where your sit bones are uh pushing down on the saddle it depends if you sit on a road bike on a mountain bike mm -hmm. on a hybrid bike and this changes the position of your sit bones and that's the reason there are so many different saddles out there and uh to know the distance from your sit bones and we have like a pillow where you can sit on and it's you know then you get oh. up and we measure the sit bones uh definitely helps to find the right to the right width, uh -huh. and then we can talk about the cushion level, you know, padding level, and things like that. Very yeah. sophisticated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those big fat cushy ones always mm -hmm. kind of. <laughs> they are good for uh -huh. hybrid bikes or you know cruiser bikes. Yeah. Uh, but when you sit on a road bike, you don't want to have that. No, no, a lot of problems. Yeah. Bike helmets, and you brought a helmet. Yes. What's happening there? Bike helmets, same thing. They're getting lighter and lighter. Uh -huh. um, this model here is a new model, just came out. Um, Sh Shiro um, is coming with the MIPS, like most of other companies coming with the safety. Uh -huh. uh, in the last few years, this safety system was an extra layer inside the helmet, right. so very easy to see. You, you These times, see yeah, it. you maybe can move it around. Uh -huh. So it's actually built so in, and the whole helmet is moving. Uh, what is really, really amazing. So it's actually built in yeah. and um, you don't really see it just holding it that it comes with the MIPS. Uh -huh. um, and right now, that's a very, very new model what just came out right now. They're still using it just for their top models. Um, quite a bit high in price, but uh, it I'm sure in the next years, in the next few years, it will come down and will make it way more comfortable. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, a lot of people are really safety conscious yes. and want to go to whatever level they need to. Yeah. to and to get the MIP system all together or start at little kid's bike, yeah. uh, kid's helmet. So this company, really every helmet they sell, if it's $60 or $350, it's always with the MIP. So uh -huh. the, sa the safety is always there. Yeah. Uh, it depends how long you want to use it, how light you want to use it, how much ventilation you yeah. need in your helmet. Now, some of my friends are interested in the lighting in the back, having mm -hmm. that built in. Yeah. Yes, very good system. Uh -huh. Yeah. The only thing is then when they use helmet cover in ah, the winter time, there it goes. quite often it covers the possibility. Mm -hmm. There are companies out where they offer a specific helm cover, what goes around the light. Oh, uh, for like Abis, sake. what is a German company, comes with a built-in rain cover, what is actually going around the light. So this is really oh, nice. Oh, wow. It depends if your light is running on standard batteries you can change out or if it runs on U UPS, you know, uh, USB, yeah. sorry, USB, uh, yeah. uh, which just means you have to be aware to charge it. And it's just like cell phone, your computer, yeah. whatever it is, you have to, a lot of things you have to charge up all the time. So yes. you have to be aware of that. And 
I find myself doing a bike ride and I'm like carrying in all this stuff yes. <laughs> off the bike yes. and yes. plugging it in yes. so that it works for the next ride. Yes. And, and more and more helmets are coming even with built-in speakers. Uh, so because like on the video they say <gasps> don't have headphones, uh -huh. so they actually have speakers in the helmet. Uh, we don't have anything in our store, but I know there are helmets out where you can get that. And the same thing, another USB, you know, like uh -huh. a lot of electronic all around. Yeah. So. Well, and that's great, but I'm like, I'm going up to the San Juans this summer mm -hmm. and they don't have, it's not an Oregon State Park. They mm -hmm. don't have electricity at every campsite. Yeah. So how am I going to get all this stuff charged up solar. again? Yeah. They, well, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's solar. And yeah. they have a charging station, I yeah. think, somewhere where we're staying. But, yeah. but just, it becomes a factor then. It all around, uh -huh. yes. And like we talked in the beginning, just with touring, you know, like in, in my case, you know, 20, 25 years ago, it was really about the writing part, meeting other people. And these days, it's more about how can I tell other people what I'm doing as fast as possible. <laughs> and it's just different than when I did it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's some, some that are doing it old yeah. school. Drive trains, those are changing too, aren't they, on bikes? Yes. I mean, the whole <coughs> trend these days goes to gravel bikes. Okay, gravel bike just means road bike with bigger tires, um, riding on gravel roads, fire roads. And um, the new trend for the last two years is to come comes from the mountain bike. Uh -huh. where you have just one chain ring in the front and then a very big cassette in the back. Uh -huh. Saves a lot of weight, shifts smoother um, all around. I think it's a better system. Yeah. Yes. And so the industry really goes toward that with specific bikes, um, specific tires, uh, like something like this one, bar tape, even the bar tape gets, you know, two, three times bigger than yeah. standard just to have <coughs> the cushion when you go on gravel all the time. So you can really compare uh, yeah. the difference yeah. thickness wise. So two yeah, millimeters <coughs> or five millimeters of, you know, um, very, 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 very interesting um, people going more and more away from backpacks. They putting more these fanny packs on oh, because they okay. don't want to carry as much <coughs> weight anymore. Yeah. Um, so how does this, this? So that's just a fanny pack and there's actually okay. a water okay. um, uh -huh. reservoir built in and then you have just enough for your wallet, your key, whatever it yeah. you need for a ride, your, uh, you know, spare kit. Interesting. But yeah, it's, it's, we sell these things right now quite a bit more than really backpacks like in the uh -huh. old days. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, the the backpack with the water reservoir exactly. in it. Exactly. Not so much where this Yeah, and this one is just around your hips. Uh-huh. Uh in the gravel category there are a lot of people put frame bags, so where you have your bottles right. they actually put big bags on. Uh, and there are a lot of companies who are going this way and um it's a very big trend here in the US. Yes. Boy, it's hard to hard to keep up with all this. Yeah. And what about bike frames themselves? You keep mentioning light, light, yeah. light, light. Where's exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people who like it more sturdy, you mm -hmm. know, like just steel is real. Yes. So they like their steel. good old uh, steel bikes uh -huh. and they are still out there. Um, and then there are people who want to have it as light as possible. And the market really has something for everybody. Yeah. I'd say this way. It depends how much you want to spend, how much time you want to spend on the bike. And... Um, like with the gravel bikes, a lot of people say, oh, they are just like cyclocross bikes, uh -huh. uh, but it's a totally different geometry. It's um, a totally different feeling when you sit on these bikes. And more and more companies are coming out with little suspensions on their frames, on their bikes, uh, even for road bikes. Oh. Um, and so it's really ma more made for long distance spending hours or days or you know yeah. weeks on the bike every day and still have it as comfortable as possible so wow yeah. so what's the lightest what weight wise what um what are the different me like metals or whatever components i mean there is the like, like steel in the most cases yeah. it's always the heaviest yes uh, then there is aluminum, carbon, or titanium. Okay. And um, mm. in the end, it really depends how much you want to spend. Okay. And how light you want it. You know, when 
um, aluminum, for example, is the cheapest one. Mm -hmm. uh, aluminum starts for on ro on gravel bikes, I would say maybe thousand, uh -huh. and goes up to two thousand. And then after that, you go into carbon, what makes makes the bike lighter, takes the vibration a bit better. Um, sometimes you cannot put fenders or racks on carbon bikes, so it really it depends how you want to use yeah. it. Yeah. So uh, again, knowing what you want to do exactly. and how you want to deck it out. Exactly. Is and the really best way important. really is to talk to us, you know, call or mm -hmm. stop by or any bike store and just talk to people who deal with these things every day and you know, yeah. we really try to find the right thing for the customer when it's available. Well, you've sure been knowledgeable, <laughs> so <Thank you. laughs> So thank you, Stefan, for coming back to the show and sharing sharing your, boy, wealth of knowledge. I know I've thank learned a lot. It's just amazing. <laughs> I can tell you do this all day, every day. So I'm glad that you're, you're our first guest back right. from our, our little hiatus. And thank you, viewers, for watching. I want to share, uh, first of all, the state of Oregon has a new bicycling manual out. And... Um, so you might want to look at that because there are some differences. We watched the safety video that certainly touches on how to be safe when you ride your bike. Ideally, we're all following the laws. Um, you know, if motorists are following, following the laws and cyclists are, there'd probably be fewer accidents. But certainly you want to know what those, those laws are and how to be safe. So check out that new Oregon Bicycle Manual, and it's, it's online. And I haven't been to a DMV yet, so I, I assume there's some there. So wanting you to be safe, and if you're new to cycling or kind of getting back into it, learn to ride safely. And that's by knowing what the laws are and watching videos like we just did earlier in the show. And riding with a group. A lot of times riding with a group of cyclists, you really learn a lot about how to be safe or how to be unsafe. You know, you see people that are out in the middle of the road and you're yelling car back and they don't pull in and, you, oh, well, that's not what I want to do. So it's a good way to learn how to, the skills and just the safety features, how to pull out to the left and take a lane and make a left turn. So it, it increases your skill riding with others. You learn a lot of new routes around town, how to get around town, just fun places to go and things to see and you meet a lot of nice people along the way. So again, I mentioned some of the events that are coming up and different bike organizations are doing rides all the time to help you get ready to do a longer ride like a metric century. So I encourage you to check things out and find out what works for you. I do want to encourage you to use your hand signals. It's the law, so know what those signals are so you can tell motorists what you're doing. Thanks for joining us and We'll be back, and we're happy to be back. Thank you again, Stefan. Thank you for having me on the show.